Hello and welcome to the virtual morning meeting for the week of May 11th. It is so good to be able to see you in our virtual classroom. As we begin today, let's start off how we usually do in God's Word. So pull out your Bible and open up to Psalm 27. Today we're going to be looking at Psalm 27, verse 1. Here's the Word of God. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? It's the word of God this morning. In this time when we're still under lockdown orders, when we still can't meet with our classmates every day and see them, and especially as we think about how this would have been the last week of the school year and we would have had some big traditions that we usually do entertainment night water day awards graduation and about how we can't do that all this year and we might be afraid when we're at home and we hear the sirens of the EMTs and of the police going by and when we hear people shouting and when we see things that are scary, and we get scared. And I want to encourage you all, when you're scared, when you're afraid, to always go to God for help. Say, Lord, help me. As simple as that. Really simple prayer. Lord, help me. I pray that to myself very often. Lord, help me. And God is our stronghold. God is our strong tower. I want you to imagine a picture that you've seen of a castle or of a strong cliff up in the mountain where people can go and hide and be safe from their enemies. And that's what God is for us. God is our stronghold. When we're afraid, when we're in trouble, we go to him for help. And I also want to encourage you in the next couple of months when we won't be having these virtual meetings to still stay in God's word. And when you need help, go to God for help. But also realize that even though you're not going to be seeing my videos or getting calls from me or getting the messages every day, that I'm still here to help as well. Now, God is everywhere at all times and all places. And God chooses to work through people. So if you are in trouble and you need help, you can still get help from trusted people, whether it be from myself or another adult that you know who you trust, and get the help that you need. Now, let's put aside our Bible and let's pull out our black binder. And we'll talk about the work we're going to be doing to wrap up your school year. Open up to the yellow tab, the very last tab in your packet. Now, since this is a public video, I don't want to go and list off your names, but I do want to spend a moment just thanking the 15 fifth graders I had this year and the nine sixth graders I had this year. All the hard work you did in class and the learning that you did, and then this odd transition to at-home learning and I pray that you continue that spirit of learning and that you continue in what you've learned to grow as you become 6th graders, 15 6th graders, and 9 7th graders in the coming months. Now let's open up. If you're a 5th grader, you see this, where it says, Baseline group test grade 5. If you're a 6th grader, you see this. Baseline group test grade 6. They are different tests, but they have the same format. If you have a really good memory, you're going to remember the first week of August last year. You sat down in class, and probably I think on the second day of school, you took this test. And as you were taking this test, I also called you back one at a time to the math center. And some of you were nervous. You didn't know what was happening. And I had you read out loud. These are called baseline reading tests. It is the exact same test you took 
in August. And what I do is I use the scores you got on the test. And if we were in class, I would have had you do a read out loud portion as well to see how much your reading level grew. Did you come into this year at this sort of reading level and did you get up? Or did you enter the school year at this reading level and you stayed the same? All right, so I want to see, did you stay the same in your reading level or did you grow? So do take your time. Don't just say, oh, it's all multiple choice, blah, 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 circle in the bubbles. Take your time, do it well. I'm going to encourage you to try to find a quiet place that you can really focus on the words being written because this helps me understand how well is our reading class going and what sort of changes need to be made for next year to increase your reading ability even more. The first section is all about vocabulary and you're going to be looking at a sentence such as Margo went to the hardware store and blank three gallons of paint blank. Well what would fit best if he's going to the hardware store and blank three gallons of paint? Well I've got some choices. Navigated. Margo went to the hardware store and navigated three gallons of paint. That doesn't sound quite right. Margo went to the hardware store and bound three gallons of paint. Well, I don't think you bound paint. Margo went to the hardware store and purchased three gallons of paint. Purchased means buy. That makes sense if he's buying, but I'm going to check the last example. Margo went to the hardware store and trudged three gallons of paint. Trudged, that doesn't sound right. I think purchased is the right answer. And you circle your right answer. After you do 25 vocabulary questions, then you're going to have reading. And for reading, you're going to read a short story. And then you have some questions that are basic recall questions. What that means is this. All the answers are found back in the text. So read the text carefully. Read the question, then go back to the story and look for the answer. That's going to help you be successful. You have 30 reading questions. After you do that, your grammar this week and spelling are all about writing a school research project. So it's got some tips to be a perfectly pro polished project writer. And then you got two student examples both of them are about the Chinese New Year. Now, what these students did is they looked at books on a nonfiction shelf in their classroom. They searched on a website and they found information. But they didn't just look at the website and copy it down word for word. No, you can't do that when you write a research project. You have to use your own words. They didn't just open a book and see facts and write it down. I know some of us are used to doing that sometimes, but not this week. You need to use your own words. So here's what you're going to do. On the next page, you have some quotes from websites about Chinese New Year's. You're going to read the quote. You're going to take your hand and cover it up. And then you're going to write a summary about it. When you use your hand to cover up the quote, that makes sure that you're not copying it. I don't want you to copy. You're using your own words. What did I read? What do I remember? What was it about? Write it down in your own words. Then you've got another sheet about taboos for the Chinese New Year. And you're going to pretend that you are a kid celebrating the Chinese New Year and you're writing six diary entries. And again, you're not just copying them down word for word. You read this article, put your hand over it, cover it, and then summarize what you read in your own words. Then you also have a page on how to reference. What that means is even though I'm not copying word for word, I still have to say where I got this information from. When you write a report for school, and let's say that you're writing a, port, a report about the Chinese New Year. I know you don't know everything about the Chinese New Year. And I know you're not just making up stuff. You had to get that information from somewhere. So when students write reports, they have to tell me 
where they got the information from. That's called referencing. Now, some of you are going to be happy because you're not going to write a grammar essay this week. Hey, great, I don't have to write a grammar essay, right? Well, because what does it say at the very end? It does say your turn to write. It says you might be doing a research project at school right now. And in fact, that's what you're going to be doing. So take your grammar, flip the page. You have one more handwriting page covering the last few letters that you haven't learned yet. Flip it over. And you have your history. And for history, you are doing a research project. At the top, you have a list of all of the civilizations we've learned so far. And then you have five tasks. So the first one is to choose a topic. Here are your topics. You can choose Mesopotamia, Israel, Phoenicia, Egypt, the Indus Valley, ancient Native Americans, China, India, Persia, Babylon, Assyria, or Greece. Choose one of those. Gather resources. Okay, where can I gather resources? Well, you can't come to the metal shelf with the nonfiction books. But you do have your ring of all your cards from every history lesson we've had this year. Parents, if you're not sure what it is, they're just little cards that are about that big with a little metal ring holding them together. And you have about 50 cards full of facts. Use those to write your report. You, if you have internet access, which if you're watching this video you do, but if your family allows you to use a computer, a tablet, or a phone, go into the Google search bar and type in your topic. Type in Mesopotamia. Gather research from there. Then on a lined piece of paper, you're going to write a one-page essay. Fill up one page about your topic. And again, don't just look up Mesopotamia and then copy down, copy down, fact, fact, fact. Read it. Put the phone away. Write what you remember. Look at your cards. Read what it says about your topic. Put them away. Write about it. What you know, what you've learned. Then you're going to illustrate your essay with a picture. Don't do that on the line piece of paper because it's going to look messy. Do that on the back of the instruction. Fill so the whole page with a color illustration. If you don't have color, just write at the top. I only have pencil. And give me a good illustration. Uh, what would I draw, Mr. Ivan? Well, in your history packet, you have all those pictures you drew earlier this year. So let's say you choose Mesopotamia. You could draw a picture of a ziggurat. Fill the whole page with what it looks like. Let's say maybe you choose ancient Native Americans. We learned about the mound builders in the Mississippi Valley. You could draw a picture of one of their mounds. Or maybe you chose Greece. You, and we learned and studied one whole day about the destruction of Pompeii. You could write about the destruction of Pompeii. All right. So that's going to be your big wrap-up history project. The next thing you're going to do is your last religion lesson, which is all about Pentecost. Pentecost is really important. We talked about it a lot in hymnology class because it is the birthday of the Christian church. And you're going to dig into your Bible, Acts chapter 2, and study all about the birthday of the Christian church. Remember, for each question mark, write an answer. And at the very end, don't forget you have a Jesus journal. Be sure to write out your Jesus journal in one paragraph. Pretend you were there in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Tell me, what did you see? What did you hear? What happened that day? The next sheet is science. This week for science, you're learning about a better gizmo, which means all about inventions. You're going to hear about a few inventions, such as uh, the Kleenex. Jello, scotch tape, Xerox machine, band-aids, popsicles, rollerblades, and Q-tips. 
Those things haven't been around forever. Somebody had an idea in their head, built a model, made an invention. You're going to read about how inventors make inventions, and then you're going to come up with your own invention. It can be, and you're going to draw a picture and write down a detailed plan of it. Now, it can be of something that already exists that you want to make better. For example, it could be a pencil sharpener. Hey, we got pencil sharpeners, but maybe you could change it to make a better pencil sharpener. Or maybe if it's not better, a more complicated pencil sharpener, something that takes up a whole table. Or you could think of something that doesn't exist already. Maybe you're tired of having to scoop out your dog's food every day. Maybe you can come up with an invention of a gizmo that would feed your dog for you. You just need to make sure that your invention has 10 parts and you draw and label each 10 parts. All right, if you're a sixth grader, skip forward a minute. If you're a fifth grader, you're going to take everything you learned about math and apply it to a real life application. And it's the one I use a lot. Why do we need to know percents and fractions and decimals, Mr. Ivan? Here's why, taxes. All of you have to pay them. Say, no, I'm a kid, I don't have to pay taxes. Uh, when you go to the store, and you buy your bag of jelly beans, they charge you extra because you're paying taxes. And when you grow up and get a job, you're going to have to pay income tax, tax on the money you bring in. If you buy a car, you're going to have to pay taxes. All right. Well, you're going to hear some real life examples about taxes. What are they used for? Why is the government taking this money and what are they used for it? And you're going to learn some vocabulary words. One is called FICA, F-I-C-A. That means Social Security. That's what the old folks in our community get to help them pay their housing and pay their food and utilities. You have federal tax. Federal tax means the government in Washington, D.C. Money you pay, it goes right to Washington, D.C., you have state tax. That means money you pay to the state of Arizona. It goes to the government in Phoenix. So money you pay that goes to Phoenix. And finally, you have net pay versus gross pay. What that means is this. When you get a job one day, you might be super excited in the interview when the boss tells you you're going to be earning $560 a week. Great. But that's gross pay. That means it's the money before taxes are taken out. After you take out the FICA, federal and state, there's less money that you're actually taking home. And that is called net pay. Gross pay, you can think, oh, gross, I got to pay taxes still. Subtract the taxes out. Net pay, think of like a net going fishing, what you actually grab and get to take home. If you are a, I'll have a video about that as well, about how to calculate those. If you are a sixth grader, you are going to be wrapping up the year talking about greatest common factors, fractions, and decimals. And also, a new thing you haven't learned yet called circumference circumference for a circle I'll have a video about how to solve those things all right guys I know summer vacation is just around the corner but keep working hard keep honoring and respecting your parents and keep learning and look forward to the day when we can gather back together in class and see each other face to face God be with you today